here. Uh, I'm Laura Steinberg. I'm the Interim Executive Director of, the, of Syracuse Center of Excellence. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the, to the Center of Excellence, the New York State Center of Excellence for Environmental and Energy mm -hmm. Systems. Um, I want to welcome the folks that are here in person. Um, and then there are some that are joining us uh, uh, on, on the web for today's forum. Forums called Occupant Behavior Driven Smart Building Controls. Uh, featuring presentations from Syracuse University Professor Bing Dong and Stephen Van Deek, who is the co-founder of the tech startup Density. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation. Fire, uh, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. So this is a monthly series of research and technology forums that are supported by the members of the Syracuse Center of Excellence Partners Program. If you're here and you're not a member but would like to learn more about the program, um, please speak with myself or with Tammy Rosanio. Tammy is raising her hand in the back and we'll be really pleased to um, talk to you more about the um, the benefits of being part of the, the Syracuse COE partner program. So we're very excited about today's forum um, because it gives us a chance to officially welcome our new Syracuse University Associate Professor for Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering as a new member of the Syracuse COE Faculty Fellows Program, Professor Bing Dong. Um, so Bing, Professor Dong has a tremendous body of work in occupancy sensing and building grid performance integration, making him really a rising academic star in the world of high performance buildings. Um, Professor Dong has achieved many awards, but probably the most prestigious is the career award given by the National Science Foundation. Um, and that career award is called Holistic Assessment of the Impacts of Connected Buildings and People on Community Energy Planning and Management. Uh, Professor Dong received his BE in Electrical and Mechanical Engineering from Nanjing University of Technology in China. Um, and this university, I'll note, is a partner uh, with us in the International Center for Green Buildings and the Urban Environment. Um, having gotten his B, uh, Professor Dong's BE in Electrical and Mechanical Engineering, he went on to receive a MS in Building Science from the National University of Singapore, and then received his PhD in Building Performance and Diagnostics from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm going to give you even a little bit more about Professor Dong because it is um, such a re remarkable uh, history of achievement. Uh, Professor Dong has over 15 years of experience in building energy performance simulation, building controls, and HVAC F FDD. He is actively involved in the projects related with occupancy, behavior, modeling, and buildings, machine learning for sustainability, wireless sensor networks in buildings, and building information modeling. He's published more than 50 peer reviewed papers. His papers are cited more than 400 times by researchers from around the world. Um, we're really excited that Professor Dong is in the process of building a lab right here in the Syracuse COE in our headquarters building here. Uh, we, we see him a lot here. He works with, with students on a regular basis. Um, and in fact, um, we are featuring Professor Dong and his students on the cover of our 2019 progress report, which we put out annually. And uh, a couple of people have them in your hands. Why don't you hold them up because I don't have one up here. There you are, and Bing is right there on the cover with graduate students and postdoc. We really uh, welcome um, Professor Bing Dong to Syracuse University, to, this, to the COE, and to, and to this forum. In addition to Bing Dong's um, uh, presentation, he's going to be joined um, by, a, by a colleague, uh, Stephen Van Deek, who is here as well. Uh, Stephen is a co-founder and chief of staff at a company called Density Inc. Density Inc. is a 50-person venture-backed enterprise uh, IoT company. It was incorporated in 2014. It helps organizations improve performance of their space by making it safer, more efficient, and more productive. From 2014 to 2019, Stephen um, has been responsible for supporting the varied um, operational needs 
of the of the company, including finance, legal, and human resources. Um, he's also the general manager of Density Syracuse office, where the company was founded and <coughs> continues to run significant operations there. Here, uh, from 2008 to 2014. Uh, Steve founded and operated a digital consultancy specializing in web and mobile application development. Steve holds a JD from SU College of Law and a BA from the University of Rochester. So without further ado, I introduce uh, Professor Bing Dong. to give our presentation here. Very my prisoners and uh, very happy to be here. So I just want to talk to Peter I can walk around. Uh, you, you can walk around. I can walk around? Okay. I like to walk around. <laughs> yeah. So, um, sure. so, so just a brief introduction. I, I get my PhD from Miller and then I, I went to uh, United Technologies Research Center for two years working on a few uh, government sponsored projects. And then I uh, went to uh, University of Texas, San Antonio uh, for six and a half years, um, first as assistant professor and then tenure to be a social professor. Um, so now I'm here and uh, I'm very glad to be here uh, because of uh, ICU and because of COE. So uh, my lab is called uh, Best Lab, uh, Best Parliament. We want to advance the fundamental understanding of the human building urban interactions. So it's not from the smart building, but also how the buildings interact with the urban energy system, such as smart grid. Through the fundamental knowledge of machine learning, data mining, AI, and social science. So uh, the motivation for my research starts with uh, human-centric uh, urban system, uh, because uh, if you think about why we build a, a water supply system, why we build the energy supply system, why we need transportation is all about people who want to meet the people need. Right? That's the uh, urban system. And that's how people interact with the uh, urban infrastructure system. It's all people centric system. Right? So, uh, as a small amount of the urban infrastructure system, smart building, you know, we provide the uh, uh, living, we provide the uh, Hosting for people, you know, stay in the buildings and uh, have uh, a workplace, you know, provide workplace, we provide uh, people to study. So, those are the places we provide as smart building, right? So, uh, if you look at uh, like how the buildings are connected with the smart grid, which I call this urban energy infrastructure system, and uh, again, it's building to great integration, right? So, uh, we have smart homes, and smart homes, if we think about uh, uh, neighborhoods, they need electricity to this form, right? It provides a smart grid. And then um, if we look at how many times people stay at homes or buildings, it's about 8% of the time is spent on the in buildings, okay? whether it's a home, whether it's an office, or whether it's other places, retail, retail right? like Target or Wigman. You know, I often say HGB because in Texas we we have HGB, which has a lot here. We have very good at our target. And then <laughs> they have a lot of uh, you know, devices, right? So uh, think about 30 years ago, we don't have iPhones, right? And then now we have a lot of connect devices, um, iPhone, and smart plug devices, or even uh, smart TV and everything smart at right? home. So we use more and more. <laughs> Kind of reduces at home and it's more unstable because I was hitting. So if you look at the typical um, you know, US um, uh, schedule for the set point, right? It's very it's fixed, you know, the daytime and nighttime set point. That's it. But people's activity is so random, right? This is uh, people's activity. Right? It's so random, getting in and out, in and out, right? So um, it's not really follow the pattern of uh, temperature set point, you know, you're ready for uh, putting smart uh, office buildings, right? So you can see there's a lot of potential that we can, uh, you know, change the set point possible according to people's schedule. So there are a lot of studies. So this is a study in 2013 by Penn State Hospital, National Right? 
Uh, the data solution study said that if we can choose which axis, as particularly in this case, is a VAD box system, according to the schedule, you know, actual schedule people, how much energy saving we can have, right? So this is from 5 to 33 percent, according to, you know, eight different time zones defined by Ashwin, right? Different uh, savings according to different places. So then uh, from, um, you know, uh, 2012 to 2019, uh, there's almost 30 kind of field studies, you know, in the uh, in the US, assuming that all the 400 plus papers, only 31 field testing, the rest is just emerging, right? So assuming that, okay, the saving came from 5% to 8%, and the this is a uh, testing duration. Some testing is 110 days, some testing, most testing is within like two, three days, okay, 20 days, period. So it shows like a lot of saving potential for energy if you do the optimal based control. Okay. So then the challenge is how we can understand the basics of people's behavior, especially in this case, the prisons in the room, right? Because uh, uh, people's prisons is really with a uh, lot of in impact and uh, elements from the social element, physiological and psychological element. Right, for a very simple example, can you predict the arrival time of you into your home office? I cannot, because it depends on if my kids are kind of fighting with me in the morning or not, right? It depends on the traffic on the road. It depends on if some, <laughs> some uh, uh, crazy driver is before me or you know, throw down my car, right? So I cannot predict myself. There's a lot of elements you know, inside to determine the arrival type of people. So, but in the HI control, what we are interested in is, is the space occupied or not? Is yes or no, right? And then, uh, how many people in the space? You can control the pressure generation rate, right? And then when the space uh, says that in the next 24 hours, okay, can we do some prediction? And then last question is, what's your first arrival time and last departure time? So even departure time, I cannot, Cannot say that. I cannot say I leave the office every time at 4 p.m. I cannot because there's a meeting, there's a meeting with students, there's a class meeting today. So there's a there's a kind of uncertainty inside, right? So then uh, it's created a very stochastic dynamic for people's schedule, you know, in the space, in my space. Okay. And then even uh, it's even worse for collaborative space, like you know, conference room, right? You can't even so now the, the uh, people try to uh, answer two questions, one is sensing, one is modeling. So sensing is how to capture or record, monitor people's behavior or prisons in the office space, okay? And the next question is, if we capture, how do we model it? Okay, those are two questions. So now, uh, in, back in 2007, uh, we started this study in Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this is our data. So what we do is, at that time, we don't have uh, people coming to us like that today. We have a camera installed in the space and to actually record on ground truth. And then we try to uh, you know, measure the environmental parameters, such as uh, temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, CO2, motion sensors, and lighting sensors. Okay? And we try to correlate those sensor readings with number of people in the space. Okay? So it's obvious, right? So there's a, a founding saying that, okay, there's correlation between carbon dioxide with a number of people. That's the uh, obvious correlation, right? But how about the uh, temperature and the humidity? How about the uh, acoustics? Okay. So this is the first kind of very first study we did. And then, then in 2016, now, which is 11 years after, so we did one study um, using the Wi-Fi signals, local network, okay? And then we tried, because, you know, sensors are expensive, right? So you cannot put like, all sensors in one space. So we tried to correlate like Wi Fi signals with uh, people's location, the track people. So then we use different machine learning algorithms. I found out you know, the uh, best accuracy is six feet radius. But six feet radius still could be at any room, right? There's like I said, there's four rooms here. Six feet radius error, still you don't know which room is in. Could be different rooms, also on this, right? Okay. So then uh, we did some research review saying, okay, what's the current setup of sensing, open sensing, right? 
provides a uh, uh, ground, ground truth for research. So those are different sensors can be image based, could so be a search for chemical based, could be motion sensors, could be radium based, half ID cap, radium based, right? So it could be uh, Wi Fi or Fitbit. Also, be consumption sensors. So there's a study trying to figure out if you are at home based on your smart meter, smart meter data. Right? It's also possible. So now there's a, a research those sensors because of our archive project, and we found out you know, half the sensor is lab DIY sensors, and half the sensor is commercial variable. And then there's a, a very uh, expensive sensor, like IR camera or human observation, right? It's very expensive. You can actually come to people from them. And then the, uh, there's accuracy, of course, right? There's uh, motion sensors, it's very cheap, but accuracy is very low, okay? So at that time, which is uh, uh, last year, we're looking for different kinds of sensors for research. And I found one sensor which is in sync and uh, it's density. Okay. So here we go, density. <laughs> Steven, it's yours. Your time. <laughs> okay. So Steven will introduce his company and how density works, and then come back to my other <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, as Laura shared, I'm Stephen Von Deek. I'm the chief of staff and a co founder at Density. We're a 50 person venture backed company with our roots right here in Syracuse. And we help organizations improve the performance of their buildings, uh, helping make them safer, more efficient, and more productive. Can I have to clear it? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, on the left here is a quick video, bird's eye view. You can see our sensor at the top. And long story short, we observe movement underneath. We detect, if it's a human, the directionality of movement. And then we adjust the count that you see in the lower right accordingly. So we increment and decrement based upon movement. When we were designing the product, there were three key pillars that were driving everything that we did. Accuracy, real time, and anonymity. So on the accuracy front, uh, our goal is to deliver numbers that are in the high, the high 90s. So nine with triple nines at the end. Um, it's very, very hard. We've actually worked on this for four or five years. and. Can tell you that it's near impossible to get triple nine accuracy. The second pillar that was driving us was real time. So our goal is to detect an event, analyze the event, send it up to the cloud, reconcile it with all the other events, turn around and provide the resulting intelligence to our customer a fraction of a second after it's captured. So that's real time. The third thing that we're going for is, is we want to be a privacy friendly solution. So our product doesn't know if it's you, me, my mom, or my daughter. All we care is that it's a person. So we count people, but at the end of the day, the customer is really interested in the insight. And here are some examples of the metrics that we can provide. So we can tell you occupancy. So for example, how many people are in this room right now? We can tell you peak times. So yesterday, last week, last month, when were the busiest times, when were the slowest times. We can tell you rates of change. So is occupancy spiking or is it declining? And we can do these things historically, real time, and on uh, a predictive basis. This is sort of representative of the types of web interfaces that we have for customers to consume the data. So we count people and we've got metrics. But at the end of the day, customer wants to make a data-driven decision, right? So these are the three spaces that we play. And this one, building automation, is probably the most interesting for today's purposes. But quickly, occupancy analytics, that's where we got our start. So this uh, could be a corporate office, it could be a hospital, it could be a museum, it could be a university setting. 
And the whole idea is, do I have too much space? Do I have too little space? Do I have the right combination of spaces? The second use case uh, is in the security industry and primarily to solve something that's known as tailgating. So imagine you're in a secure building with an access control system and you're issued uh, a card. You swipe the card, it unlocks the door. Pretty simple concept. The problem is one badge swipe, two entrances. That's known as tailgating in the industry. Uh, you no longer know who's in your space and it's no longer secure. So because we placed a premium on being real time and accurate, we can tell you when two events happen in quick succession and mash it up with data from an access control system, recognize the tailgating event in real time and provide an alert to the security team. But third thing is really what we're here to talk about today, um, and that's building automation. Uh, we think this is probably the biggest opportunity of all for us, and we're crazy excited about this. And, Really happy to be working with Bing to try to understand the space. Um, and that's essentially using our data um, to inform uh, and control building systems. So, for example, imagine using real time occupancy for demand control ventilation. Um, so, I thought you might just like to see quickly what the product looks like in the wild. It's designed to go above a door. Uh, an entrance or a threshold. There's actually one above that door. You can check it out uh, right there. after the presentation. And that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, you know, long story short, 3D field of view, uh, measuring the area in and around the threshold of the door. Objects move through. Uh, we determine the directionality. We adjust our, our real time count. And the last slide that I have is an exploded um, view of our product. So you can see everything that goes inside. Um, it's actually pretty much a computer above the door. But the thing that I want to point out is that we're doing the final assembly test and package of this product right here in Syracuse, about 10 blocks that way in the tech garden, the new hardware center that we opened last year. So we receive all the components, we put it together like a sandwich, we load up software, we test it, we calibrate it, we put it in a box, we print out labels and get it ready to send to our customer. It's, it's a modest operation, but something we're pretty proud of to be doing right here in Syracuse. Um, and if anyone's interested in seeing the operation, I'd love to meet you after and potentially give you a tour. Um, so that's all that I have. Uh, hopefully I stayed in my allotted time. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for having me, so Steven talked about uh, a new uh, sensor which provides information that actually we need for uh, future research. So if we have those information, what we can do? So this one, I start from the very simple study. So this is a study we did in the 2005, sort of the at CMU. And uh, you know, in this room, we got all different sensors, you know, temperature and uh, uh, human um, motion sensors, and then we measure, you know, if it's power metering and the weather station, we measure everything we can measure in this house. And we try to control based on what is, uh, we we'll detect people's behavior, right? Presence in those homes. So the results are showing that we actually can, uh, I don't know why this number, I made a slide in that, actually, in the back, in the windows. So, so it's found about, um, 15 to 20 percent of uh, savings on the heating, and then about 30 percent on the cooling just for the HF. Okay, so those are the savings on from. So we actual increment the control in the house and we measure it based on smart meters we have, right? In the meters. And we prove, prove spend a whole year, we spend a whole year to experiment, cover the both heating and cooling season, and then we prove that uh, can save a uh, large amount of energy on the HF. So then later on, uh, we just started using the data from Pecan Street, Pecan Street in Austin, right? It's a rural community. It's about 1,000 uh, plus homes. They install smart meter and also uh, uh, temperature in the houses and they record everything happening in the house, like when you change the thermostat that and uh, the usage. So we learned that uh, we think of home when they have EVs, 
So we learn the pattern of all, all charging EVs. When they charge EVs, actually. Also, we learn the pattern of when people are using the water heater for those houses. Okay. So why we know EV? Because we want to know when the people arrive and charge their home. Not only they arrive home, they plug in, they start charging the EV, right? And then they unplug EV and decide to leave home. And then why are we using the uh, water heater? Because we want to control water heater. They sometimes we use, right, when they use water heater. So we ignore the questions here. It's complex called uh, NPC, model produced in short formulation. And then, uh, you know, those are arrival time, time of use, the equations, do some magic in meta optimization, and then the results. So the results showing that, okay, if we use this, we can uh, control the EV charge, which can sit uh, any cost by 10 to 30%, you know, based on time of use. And this is the uh, annual simulation, you know, about when the energy electricity uh, consumption reduced based on the time of use. And then uh, HVAC. So we can reduce HVAC by 20%. You know, that's uh, typical. The without only open schedule, knowing open schedule, and with our magic algorithm, it looks like this. It's fine, right? So the point I want to make is the open behavior actually can impact the engineering design of operation when you know this. Because you know there's people's behavior, you can, you know, kind of so we, uh, redesign the neural system, right? Instead of uh, always have 10% lower sum to oversight the system. Okay. So next one is more interesting actual field testing. You know, this is uh, in San Antonio called uh, SATC, San Antonio Technology Center. This is like Tech Garden, it's a, a startup incubator. Okay. So um, this test I win the Smart City 58 awards in 2019. So what do we do? We implement this uh, our match algorithm into this whole building, which is Edison's Mobility. And then we compare the action between the interested viewers. So we start the advancing control in January 2018. And going on, going on. And we compare the deal with last month, uh, last year, same month. Okay. So on average, we can save 12% of whole building energy consumption of whole building. Of course, each track is much more, right? Because you know, HRF is part of the building, but for a whole building, it will be a small purpose. Uh, while implementing our magic algorithm. Okay. So then um, uh, we are thinking about okay, what about if we have uh, renewable energy on site? Right here, right? So then we put a, uh, we we did a test on the uh, drone based Antonio uh, microgrid system. Uh, this is me and this is Hannah. Hannah is here, my student from Texas. And uh, uh, this is a, a, it's a 65 kW hour Toshiba uh, array and with a 10 kW heat system. And the building is uh, on it. And uh, we use, uh, um, you know, we invent some uh, communication algorithms to talk to the event uh, inverter, you know, to the inverter. And then we talk to the battery system. And we Control the battery when it's charging discharge. So the uh, this is the battery power charge discharge, and this is the real one building power, actual building power. And this is the optimized building power that we base on our algorithm, right? And this is uh PV generation. So you know the result is that we can reduce the demand by 30%, okay? Peak demand. And the total cost, energy cost about 20 percent as uh, using the PV and battery system. And plus, we understand the schedule of this uh, building. Uh, this is a library building, in a small library building. Okay. So, in theory, so what I plan to do is I uh, will plan to install a, a battery system here. It is 30 um, kW and the 60 kW hour battery um, in the theory. And we will do the similar test that we did before on the joint base Antonio. To look at, you know, if we use battery energy storage, what is the peak reduction and what is uh, overall energy cost reduction? Of course, it's according to the uh, rate from natural grid, right? I'm very really excited about this, and the uh, university pretty much approved it for installation. So, this will be ready, I would say, uh, by the uh, end of this semester. Awesome. So, we can do something in the summer. So next one, uh, what well, I want to look at is the battery energy storage is really ready for large deployment for commercial right? So we look at the uh, 80 cities, 70 companies, 
and uh, I work with a group of uh, uh, graduate students like Hana and also a group of other students looking for utility price, rent structures for 70 utility companies of a whole country. And this is a uh, different time zones, right? Number of cities in different time zones. So we're using the uh, 16 DOE reference buildings. Uh, so if you don't, don't know uh, what is DOE reference building, so it's uh, uh, 16 type of commonly used commercial buildings in all US. From the uh, large, medium, small scale commercial building, office building, to the restaurants, to the um, primary elementary schools, to the multi-family high-rise buildings, to the uh, hotels. So those are commonly used, 16 different types of uh, commercial buildings in the US. So we use any part of the NetApp to do some controls. And then this is what we found out. So uh, they, they, uh, based on the price, right? If it is still the price, which is you know, uh, those are the uh, cities with uh, those are buildings within four years payback. If you have a TOE price, time of use price, this is essential, right? You use a TOE price within two years. Very fast payback within two years if you use a battery system. Of course, you have to size the battery based on our national priority, right? <laughs> and then uh, next one, what what are major differences happen to the uh, you know major differences, right? So major differences happen to large commercial buildings. So for large commercial commercial buildings, if the utility price is different, which in a payback is so different. Okay. But for small and the medium sized commercial buildings, it's really does not really matter a lot, you know, based on our size. Okay. So which means for large commercial buildings. It's very, very uh, uh, worth to do this our better system in the building. So now, next one is uh, um, uh, talk about how how we, the building can be connected to a smart grid. Okay. So this is famous backup, I think most people know from ISO, California ISO. So this is kind of saying that if I have a lot of PV generation in California, which is you know they say hundred percent renewable, right? So it will be over generated risk during the peak time when the sun shines, you know, every PV is working at maximum capacity and uh, which <laughs> makes the grid is uh, over generated, right? Okay, now we cannot control the sun, right? We have to sound as passive. We can only rely on the weather. So suddenly the sunset will go, go happen, right? At 6 p.m. So it requires ramp, it's so deep. Because everybody cannot rely on PV, everybody needs power from grid. Because the PV is not guaranteeing any power anymore, right? After some time. You know what I mean? So there's a ramp lead about 13,000 megawatts in just three hours. And the generator has to work so hard to try and generate so much out, so much energy. We know the generator is not like work nature. It's, it's not instantaneous, the work is slow. Okay? You have, it, turn on the off generator, it costs a lot of money. That's the utility company's problem. Okay. So what do we what a building can do? What a building can do. So it's called uh, uh, how much flexible loads building can provide to uh, you know smooth out this curve, smooth out this curve. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, what are the impacts of greater stability if all the buildings mm -hmm. doing this kind of smart controls? Okay. Because you know the um, how much, uh, how, uh, uh, 70 percent of uh, electricity generated by the power plant going to buildings, the rest 70 percent going to others. Okay, so if all buildings doing the smart controls, they will impact largely on smart grid. That's a huge impact. So, I, so what we did is uh, we called uh, we tested the grid. Okay, so if you want to test all buildings smart controls grid, use the I Trouble data test. This is called I trouble you 342 low, low voltage uh, distribution network. It's connected to 15,000 buildings. 15,000 buildings. Okay, it's a large network, right? And uh, we um, create different types of buildings, uh, including commercial and uh, residential buildings, and we do smart controls on those buildings. So this is a simulation 1,000 office buildings with a uh, without occurrence schedule. Oh, uh, this is the schedule. Uh, with all things are next, right? And this is uh, uh, actual loads of life. And then if you have a, a dynamic schedule, right? 
So this is a stable edge catalog with a fixed scale. But if you have a direct scale, this is see this is more flexible. Okay, which means your uh edge stack can provide more flexible loads. Okay, so what I mean, um, if I know there's nobody in the room, I can adjust the thermal effect, which will either decrease or increase your edge stack load depending on the grain heat. If it's great, if it's great, have all generation risk. What I can do as building to response great is I can control the HVAC to dump a lot of cooling energy into a room which is not occupied without sacrifice people's comfort, right? And to you know provide greater more loads to avoid over generation risk. And then here, okay, is a it's a ramp up so quickly and the grid say I don't have I do not have this capacity to ramp up 30 megawatt, 34 megawatt in two hours. Can you really help? Can you help? Yes, I can help. So I'm going to uh, elevate the temperature in the, in the summer. Elevate the temperature in the room which is not quite in the summer. You know, without you know, reduce the HVAC load without sacrifice people cover. You have more people in the room, right? So see the building can respond to it so quickly and fast. So this is what we did. So we have more flexible load dynamics of the load. And we try to look at what the potential of uh, building can provide bricks for road to the grid. Uh, so we lost in this. So we simulate lots of simulation of uh, photo solar homes. And we found out we can have a 30% saving on the air conditioning, which is 30 plus minus 30% bricks for road, right? And then 21% saving for EV and 20% saving for water heater. So that's the one home we can provide. So if you integrate them together, this is overall a great load. And uh, you can see that uh, we can actually, based on people's behavior, we can actually reduce the peak load of grid by uh, 70%. That's a lot, 70%. This is a small uh, distributing grid. Maximum is 40 megawatt hour. But uh, you know, think about the whole city, right? How many gig hours? You know? And then the overall energy reduction is about 21%. See, the curve is smooth up instead of have different peaks smooth up. That's the amount of amount we can reduce. So again, uh, this is some study. So for my lab, um, I started some other things. You know, for example, I started what is how to improve human performance and productivity. I started how to model energy uh, in production buildings and I forecast in uh, production for buildings for next, you know, next day or 24 hours. Then I started energy system diagnostics using advanced sensors to study optimal behavior. And then I also started to show an optimization of the building energy system, and also great. And uh, my uh, principle <coughs> is using AI, uh, data analytics, machine learning, with uh, monophysics modeling, uh, heat transfer also analytics of buildings, and also the behavior science you know, that we talk about, right? So uh, my current project, so the first project, uh, I have three current projects. The first project is sponsored by RI, which is uh, to uh, test uh, optimal behavior of HVAC um, controls. How much any settings can from these controls, right? And as as partner with other uh, other organizations, University of Alabama and Taylor New Year's, the TNL, Welling Lab, and so And then a second project is about uh, spatial temporal data drones uh, with an image forecasting for the implementation of the NPC. So why weather forecasting is important? Because every building is using weather on the board or using airport data. You know, not not many buildings has uh, outside weather station has COE COE has two outside weather station. So even on as you campus, I only found one outside weather station. Right? A lot of buildings does not have weather station. You know the weather is the temperature impact by a lot of elements. So, uh, from this block to next block, the temperature will be different, slightly different because of wind speed directions. So, this case, uh, we developed a new uh, spatial control, the so CAPS models, to forecast building level temperature differences. So, I know IBM has, uh, uh, they bought with underground IBM. They, they provide uh, weather forecasting at uh, uh, 500 meters, no, actually 1,000 meters. 
by one thousand meter from okay, IBM. That's the finest grade they have, but it's still not enough for buildings. So we provide on site, you know, with a, a forecast. Okay. And then we will implement this and uh, how how this will forecasting will impact the future, any service, any service of future. So that's really your project. So last project is my is this career project we just started. Um, so this part are looking at uh, uh, you know uh, can we model the human dynamics at other scale? So before we use density to model the space, right? Human presence and dynamics in the space at building level. But what about other scale, right? Because it will impact the uh, energy community, the whole city energy planning, right? So this is uh, modeling energy model for two thousand buildings at San Antonio. And what we did is we use the Twitter and the whatever mobile phone, you know, can look at okay, can we uh, understand like for the whole building in real time how many people are approximately you know in this building, even on ratio itself. So we can you know look at okay, maybe uh the busy time, those buildings uh, generate a lot of energy okay, because a lot of people are here. And then the uh, there's less people are here. So maybe in the future for the smart grid planning. We should have more focus on this this part. Okay, even in the peak time, we should ask those buildings to reduce energy instead of those buildings because they are not busy. So uh, all we want to do uh, is look at can we transfer people right? So this is an image from Boston and my end. So the red dot is people at work. The yellow dot is other places, and the blue dot is people at home. So can we understand people's you know behavior at every time where they are? Are they on the road? Are they in the office? Are they in the room? Okay. So in that case, we can better planning for the transportation, for the water supply, also for the smart building issues. So this concludes my talk. Thank you. So now we started, we do 24 hours ahead prediction. Uh, but it depends. So some other studies do six hours ahead or three hours ahead. It already depends on how far you want to control your thermal plan. But in our in my uh, case study, I always use 24 hour ahead prediction, including the occupancy and also the temperature solid for next 24 hours. But the benefit. Diminish as the time increase. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. From an HVAC standpoint, which has been my career, uh -huh. I could been comfort, indoor air quality, things of that nature, which will relate to productivity, satisfaction. Yes. You're making assumptions on the HVAC system's response rate, cycling capability. Did you do any life cycle costing relative to impact on longevity of the system, the uh, comfort factor, the occupants seeing your set points going up and down, being manipulated by something? Every 50 minutes. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no. And uh, actually, this is. Uh, my outcome project, uh, which is uh, I think we go for the uh, next year. So it's, it's ongoing. Okay. Yes, and then it's even part of very good uh, new fund. So uh, in our project, you know, we just we have we have good good meetings for with quite a team. And uh, um, yes, we we are realized, you know, uh, we discussed your we can show the HR every 50 minutes or half an hour or hour. That will exactly impact the longevity of the system. Right. Yeah, and uh, then you have to think about okay, do we need a a, a system long, longer last uh, last longer or you want to save energy now and repeat the system break earlier? It's all great. It's a trade off between them. Yes, I agree. Yes. Very good. Thank you. We have one from the web. 
Uh, what kind of platforms would be used to tie the occupancy data gathered to control the uh, to the control system? Yeah. For example, my EcoV remote sensors tie occupancy to the thermostat. Yeah. So we use Python, and we uh, most time we program in Python and do connect uh, EcoV to the uh, thermostat and for residential buildings, which is easier. I mean, commercial building is a little bit uh, uh, tricky and also more complex because commercial building use a uh, uh, technique to learn on system, right? So what we did before is we use both Java and Python to connect with the technique and overwrite the priority level in the technique and based on our output. So we run the simulation uh, in Python on that app and then we communicate through the Python platform talk to the backend system. The backend system talk to the validation system. That's all we did. <coughs> yeah. And so I have a question for Steve actually. In the in the density system, you folks very intentionally created a, a system that is anonymous, that index identities. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the market driver for that need. It must have been tempting, particularly with security applications, to do a snapshot of those databases, right? Yeah, so chosen not to. So when we actually got started, uh, we weren't privacy friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were trying to solve the problem uh, through harvesting Wi Fi signals. So the phone in your pocket, uh, it's constantly looking to connect to a wireless network. And you can harvest all of those signals and use it as a proxy for people count. Uh, and I want to say four, five years ago, there was a growing public conversation because everyone started to realize that unbeknownst to them, their Wi-Fi signals could be harvested in an attempt to understand how they move through the world. And uh, people weren't happy with this. So we talked amongst ourselves and we said, um, you know, what side of this conversation do we want to be on? And that's when we made the decision that we were going to be a privacy friendly solution uh, going forward. And anonymity became one of our uh, key pillars ever since. And of the companies that are out there doing this kind of work, are, you folks are unusual, is that right? Where so, I'm sorry, that was the last part? Where that anonymity, difficult uh, word to say, is a key driver. Yeah, so, so counting people has been around forever. Uh, and historically solved through a clicker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> most People counting solutions are directed at the retail space. Like if you were to go out and like sort of like do a, an assessment of the market, the competitive landscape, you'd see that most most of these organizations spend their time in the retail space. Um, one thing that's interesting about retail is they're looking to invade your privacy every chance they get. <laughs> like they want to know everything about you. They want to know your age, your race, your ethnicity. They want to know who you came with. They want to know how long you stayed. They want to know where you go in the store. Uh, so we're on the other end of the spectrum. Um, so yeah, we're 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 kind of unique. Although I will say that I think some other companies are, are starting to adopt privacy friendly approach and introduce privacy friendly products. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of our work is in the workplace, uh, and if you want to be um, you want to be successful in the workplace, uh, you know, it, 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 it's helpful to be privacy friendly. At least that's what we've done. So, does that answer your question? Okay, sweet. Thanks. Yeah. How, how is your, your work, um, you, things like architects or facility managers? Uh, and the first example, the first. which was occupancy so, um, analysis. Yeah. First use case, um, the buyer might be someone in the real estate department, it might be someone on the facilities team, it might be someone on the workplace team. Uh, so depending upon the buyer, the use case is slightly different. Um, but uh, half of them are looking to use the data like internally to understand how their space is used and then they data-driven decisions to optimize their space. Do I have too much, do I have too little, do I have the right combination of spaces? So something that they'll hear a lot is, I'm sorry? Utilization. Util yeah, utilization. 
utilization. So something that uh, we'll hear a lot is I can't find a breakout room. I can't find a, a four person room for us to have this meeting. Uh, and the person that's responsible for the real estate, uh, they're like, I don't believe that. Like, I don't think we need to add space. What we need to do is understand, should that be a 20 person conference room that only gets used two hours a week? Or should it be chopped up into five four person rooms? So that would be, an, that would, is that, that yeah. your question? That, that would be an example. What you can also do though, is you can take the data and you can make it available to your employees to make them more productive. So you could say, like, like imagine you work for a Fortune 1000 and you're in a, you're in a, you're in a building, right? And there's like a dozen floors and there's a hundred conference rooms scattered across the dozen floors. And all you're doing is trying to find a room right now. Well, you could look at your conference booking solution, which at the time is going to be wrong because people reserve a room and don't show up or people don't reserve a room in the squad. <laughs> or you could use a product like Density to understand availability in real time and direct your, your uh, employees to an to available room. Uh, another question for Steve. Uh, uh, um, so you said your accuracy is is ninety nine percent ish. Yeah, I mean it depends on the environment. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like a retail application, that that's amazing. But I imagine if you put it towards like a safety application, of do we get all the people out of the building? Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the engineering. Like, what is it that's what's your obstacle? What's the engineering problem right now? Is, I mean, and I'm trying to get a sense of how this compared to like a if you had human beings with a clicker, are you are you beating them? Uh, so the challenge is that it, it's designed to be deployed above a door, and I never realized how much odd behavior happens in and around the door. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely crazy. People will hold the door for a coworker to be polite. Uh, two people will enter at the same time. Uh, so a break beam solution, for example, which we spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand is ineffective. Uh, or uh, people will be going opposite ways and they'll collide. Or people get halfway through a doorway and they'll say, "Forgot my wallet," and they'll immediately turn well, around. One of the ones you had in the yeah up there. Yeah. Or inanimate objects. Someone a rolling trash can it happens all the time in the workplace. The facilities team is moving around a rolling trash can. Or if you're deployed in a cafeteria setting and someone's holding a, a tray or someone's got a backpack on, I mean. There's all sorts of weird stuff that happens. You need to be able to account for all of that in order to deliver accuracy in the triple nines. So, I mean, I hope that answers your question. That's why it's hard. So, better identification of human, of, of human versus non-human sounds like one of your yeah. outstanding challenges. Yeah. yeah. So we use depth data, uh, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with ImageNet, but ImageNet is a database of essentially annotated objects, so tree, bird, car. There is no equivalent for depth data. So we've developed our own depth map. <laughs> and we have a growing database of all these analyzed annotated things to, to help improve the accuracy of our algorithms. Would an overlay of infrared help on that in terms of, well, that's got body heat, that doesn't? Uh, potentially, potentially, potentially. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to improve, but, uh, you know, that's your bad organization is just like go, 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 go. And you don't get a lot of time to like uh, tinker with this, tinker with that. Does that answer your question? No, it doesn't. I, mean, I can't believe you're getting 99 of it. That's, that's, I, I think you're being. Yeah, I mean, again, it's an environmental thing. Mm -hmm. So if different environments are perform stronger than others, but you know, always trying to do better. We have a couple of questions for the list. Yes. Uh, I think this is for Bing. What energy co stimulation was used in the study? Any consideration? Um, so there's a, a few platforms um, that can consume the energy with uh, controls and also death row. Uh, for example, uh, PCPTV from LV in there. And then uh, you can also uh, consume it. You can DIY by yourself, like using the app and any parts. So those are platforms. Great. I have another question, uh, a follow-up question to the first question I asked. Uh, uh, who does the programming between this sensor and the commercial building control system? Control systems seem to be a weak link in reliability. Does this pro 
programming help solve this? So in the research project, of course, it's great students program, right? <laughs> Between the sensor and then the uh, you know the uh, initial building operation system. Um yeah, that's all I can say. You know, if if uh, and I know there are some companies doing this as well, and uh, um, uh, they try to commercialize you know this part to be an uh, actual product. Can you talk a little bit about your plans for using the facilities within this building and obviously the facilities? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You mentioned, I you mentioned the project, yes. yes, you have some things for students. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you're going to utilize the facilities in the building? Yeah, sure. So, I actually put in slides, right? <laughs> so, for this, this, for this uh, COE, uh, um, currently there's uh, one ongoing project, which is a project. So we plan to uh, install the glory install density sensor, right? So in this room and then next uh, room, so closely and the uh, And then we use floor two as a test bed. So based on people coming in, and then try to you know adjust the the HX system called second floor, and to try to uh, look at how much any savings we can have. That's all. This is by our project. And the testing will be whole year, uh, which starting from you know end of this year to next end of next year. So this one project, another project is uh, um, above. Uh, together with this project is a battery energy storage system, right? So we have a battery energy storage system inside. With before this summer, and we will try to do the model response, uh, you know, capabilities to see how much uh, energy, critical energy, we can uh, get from this uh, BS system, right? So then uh, another project is which I'm interested in, and uh, is using the TIQ lab. So I think the TI Everybody knows TIQ lab, right, on the first floor. Yeah, I'll actually explain. <laughs> so TIQ lab is on the fifth floor, and then the system is on the first floor. So TIQ lab, uh, there's two identical rooms, two identical, okay, next uh, side by side, side by side next to each other. It's very unique in the whole country, I would say. Um, maybe there's, I don't know if there's one in the DT, but it's very unique. Okay? So side by side. Okay. So you can do many experiments studying the productivity of people. So you can say, okay, one room putting you know 72 degree F temperature, another room putting 73, and uh, at the same time doing the same task, you know, also productivity, right? Based on temperature. All you can do is uh, what I plan to do is okay, I um, look at energy consumption. So I, when I, I measure, the, I use density sensor, measure the people in the next room, which is office, right? And mimic the heat and uh, equipment used in these two rooms. Exactly the same. And then one room, I use my smart controls. Another room, I use uh, you know, the default controls for, uh, for the DAD bar you know, in, in these two rooms. So then I can see you know, how much energy is reduced based on my smart controls in this room. And so the time lab is, is a very good uh, lab you know, to do comparison studies, control lab studies. And okay. one is the control room, another one is test room. Can we say just for clarification, it's, it's the, for those who don't know the acronym, Total Indoor Environmental Quality Lab. Yes, yeah. Thank you. It's information on our website. Okay. I do have some like, some thoughts about using it with students as well as doing research in the CIEC. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, this semester I'm teaching a class called the control and the organization of uh, building energy system. So my final project I have 25 students in my class. So my final project is to let students design the optimal control for the CIEC lab. So one is optimal control, another one is not optimal control. So then they can. Kind of play around, you know, different diffuser, different control algorithms, set points, you know, for the TIQ lab. So that's my class project. Yeah. I think students, you know, I always believe you have to learn the HVAC by seeing it, touch it, feel it. That's nearly it. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you learn the HVAC system. You know, you cannot based on the textbook, this is a five actors and that. And you have to go inside and see this is filter, this is bad, and you feel the air come up, right? And you Hear the noise of the fan turning off. That's how you learn the HVAC. Yeah, this is for Steve. 
uh, what kind of sensors do you use? Do you use infrared or optical or yeah, so, microwave? So this, this, is, this is powered by a technology known as time of flight. Time of flight. And it's uh, infrared based. So what happens is the sensor shoots out light and the light bounces off of the objects that are in the field of view and the light gets returned. And it essentially returns what, what's known as a depth map. Uh, but if you've seen a topographical map before of like a, of, of like a, a landscape, top of, that, that, that's what a depth map kind of looks like. So you've got all these depth values and then you use that to understand the objects and the movement thereof. That helpful? Yeah. Okay. Sort of like a radar. Uh, so it's not it's not actually a, a radar technology, but we, we are working on something that's more akin to radar in our lab. Do you use CW or is it pulse? Okay, so uh, unfortunately I, I I'm not able to answer that question. I don't know. Uh, so I'm a lawyer by education. I don't even know why they let me be a help out here. Uh, uh, so I'll look into that and I'll, I'll try to get you an answer. But I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't know right now. Share with you about as much as I know. Thank you. Well, so, so the yeah. really is a question for. Well, we look at we evaluate so many sensors now. Which mm -hmm. one is that right for giving the potential? I think most of your study is for the sensor, the sensor to evaluate it. And the commercial yeah. Do you, you have any recommendation now? No. My recommendation is if you don't consider about our price, use that sensor. That's not the <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I have to discuss that. Uh, Penny asked me a question about how to do it by the sensor. And so, based on my research, probably that sensor is the only sensor which is uh, anonymous. You know, you cannot tell who is that, who is that, based on my research, you know, of the market. So, I have another sensor from a company called uh, uh, Captive. It's uh, camera based. So, you can see the people, you can actually, who install in the uh, living, uh, we are living there, right? We are living there. You can tell the people. But then, a uh, then sensor based on text. Data, which is you cannot tell who is being who I didn't you know anonymous. So I call I I don't see you know if if I want to use this I will use this and uh, uh, plus the, but the, not problem but again it depends on how much it is the price right so if it's only for energy saving purpose then uh, you have to make sure your energy saving the money you save can cover the cost of sensor. Well, uh, no, I mean, I think, I think you did. Okay. Um, the only thing that I would add is um, our interest in building automation right now is more on a research level, trying to understand the opportunity, trying to understand the market, trying to understand the problem, how to solve it, the right technology, the right solution. And that's why we're pumped to be working with, with Ming and his team to understand the space. And if we come to learn that there is a massive opportunity there, which we believe there is, we will work to uh, offer the right type of product for the market. But as it currently stands, our product is priced for the workplace. It's a different buyer, it's for the workplace or security solutions, it's a different buyer with a different need, different problem. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question. Um, has any of your research uh, looked at maybe the quality of the air in terms of, uh, you know, air intake having um, levels of BTEX or any sort of chemical pollutants and how it affects productivity? Okay. Uh, not yet. Not yet. So the test uh, that I mentioned in the TIP lab that we plan to do. Uh, with Jason and Men is looking at both the energy reduction and also the you know air quality impact on people. 
while you reduce the energy, right? So, for example, uh, actually guideline saying that you can reduce the average energy based on number of people. That's all integrity, right? So we can reduce the average intake based on the people counting and how that actually impacts the energy and also the you know, effort. So that's a pro proposal we write in general. Hopefully it's only then we can do the project. <laughs> Yeah. I have a question. In the larger uh, uh, game of things, probably it will be something that we will be fighting. Is uh, data is ubiquitous, right? It's, it's everywhere, and you can almost get the people in that building not just from sensors, but automatically because we are connected somehow. Yeah. You know. So, what will be the uniqueness of, for the research that you you have in mind? Uh, is it that algorithm? Or is this more than the algorithm that you are trying to save energy? I think uh, um, first of all, let's talk about data. So I think uh, um, if we want to understand approximately how many people in the in the building, you can, you know, based on the Google places, based on the social media, but for each tech system, we have to know it precisely. Right? There's a and also security risk. There's a big difference between one people, zero people, and all, because that would determine set point, total space, right? Because no people, there's people, it's a huge difference, okay? So we are at that precise. And then um, the uniqueness is once we know that label of precise of people, then it is, it's like how you can better design your switch structure instead of, uh, you know, raw based Common right? So that's the uniqueness. Okay. So let me kind of go off of what you just said. Is it, yeah, sure. are you looking at um, dwell time in the space as well, due to you know cycle reliability on your systems, your HPC systems? Yes, I'm looking at real time. Yeah. Dwell time as well. So how long they're actually in the space? Yes, the duration. We call duration. Duration. Yes. How long these people in the space? And that is based on the past data. So we can use uh, some model to learn, you know, the original people. Regarding the uh, uh, occupant behavior and our occupants in the building, uh, yeah. when you are uh, using this uh, privacy based uh, based study, just can count the number of occupants in the building, but occupant behavior goes beyond that. Yeah. Control the building, okay? and he control the excess temperature, unfortunately. And uh, um, um, then, uh, what what about the people interaction? How people interact with building? So, of course, it's through the prisons. Number of people in space, right? So now, if the building has multiple windows, so maybe there's an opportunity. You know, we can look at how people open the window, when people open the window, especially in the COE, we have upper windows and on different floors, right? And then we can say, okay, this is the time people offer a window based on auto temperature and automation. And can we do some control on that? That's, that and also that in the residential buildings, there's more because you can you can record people how people change some step. Okay, so that that is uh, you can involve more human building interactions in the residential buildings. Hopefully, I answer the question, but it's a very good question. Yeah. Anybody else? For the web. Well, let's give a round of applause to you.
totally tremendous. It's been well planned by terrific staff, and, uh, and it's been purposely um, uh, set up so that everybody has exactly the right food. Everybody. <laughs> 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 <laughs>